Welcome back to The Move, where I've been through the book 10 minutes at a time. I'm your host, Justin Ku, and in today's episode, we're talking about that one time in the Bible where 11 brothers gang up on the smallest brother, strip him down naked, beat him, throw him in a pit, and then sell him into slavery. If you're wondering, what are we looking at? Genesis chapter 37, verses 12, all the way to the end of the chapter. Hanging out today with Pastor Jonathan Leonardo, uh, checking in as, because I'm sure you're going to say it, Deacon Ku, which is something I mean, that... <laughs> if you keep calling me Pastor Jonathan Leonardo, I'm just going to keep calling you Deacon Ku. We, uh, we have started a new podcast for our church yep. and out of the two episodes thus far you've introduced me as deacon coup each time yeah. Un- unprompted uninstigated i should i should no offer. no 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 no. it's definitely instigated <laughs> okay and prompted by you when you started addressing me as pastor now it might not be that you've mentioned me as pastor in the immediacy of that podcast right <laughs> but let it be known to yourself and to the people's you started this. So what I'm learning is actions have consequences, which is kind of what Joseph is learning in in, in this story. I, I actually wanted to start off this episode by sharing a mildly traumatic, but also kind of entertaining story about my childhood, if you don't mind. Okay, go for it. Uh, as I might have alluded onto in one or two of the episodes of The Move, um, my brother and I didn't always get along when we were kids. We would fight and bicker and, you know, trying to be the single mother, driving the kids back from school or whatever activity we might have had. And we're in the backseat punching each other and yelling at each other or what are the cases one day my mom finally just has it up to here and she pulls over to the side of the road towards this like government building and i would later recollect that it was actually a fire station okay and it's it's dark you know we're yelling and screaming and there's just like there's this commotion going on and my mom just at her wits end. and by the way i, I don't hold this against her yeah, i think yeah, it's yeah. just you do what you can and parenting was different back when i was a kid kind yeah, of yeah, right? yeah sure she tells me, get out of the car, go there and tell them I don't want you anymore or something along those lines. Maybe it wasn't those words. I'm sure it wasn't that strong of a language, but it was that sentiment. And it, it, was, it was some version of, you out. oh, it, it freaked me the heck out. And while my brother and I were fighting at this point, like I'm just sitting there in the, in the seat, like silence, just like, what do I do? Like I'm, I'm playing the picture in my mind. I'm going up to the door. It's like these like large bay doors that rise up yeah. to the fire trucks and come through. Yeah. And I'm just like, well, what would I, I think? What I was thinking was, well, what do I say to them? Cause that, that's just, that's just such an awkward place to be in as, as a young kid. And I don't know how long this moment lingered. What did you say? I, I didn't say anything. So actually what was happening is I was lingering in the in the seat, like not having the courage to get up and like leave because in my mind, like I'm done with the family. Like that's it. Uh-huh. And it's my little brother who comes to the rescue. No, mommy, don't let him go. Don't <laughs> let him go. And my little brother, Jordan, comes to the rescue. And and it's it's amazing because up to that, we're fighting. Wait, so your your brother's your little brother? Yeah. You wouldn't guess that by seeing us next to each other because he's he's got probably like 50 pounds on me. Yeah. At least. <laughs> or maybe around that. Right? But yeah, he's two years younger than me. But he's the one that comes to my rescue. And I just think about how we were fighting so much at that time. And yet, in a moment of crisis... He's the one that stood up for you. He had my back. And I think about this story, like, because there's context. Actions have consequences. Uh, little little Joey's over here snitching on, on the brothers or doing whatever he's uh-huh. doing, acting a fool. And now the brothers not only just want to get rid of him, but like they actually go through with it. They sell him into slavery. They pretend like he was dead to their dad. And the, this thing lingers. Like, I'm sure there were multiple opportunities where they could have like, whoops, like this was all a joke. You've been pranked. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they go through with it. And I'm just like, man, this is some animosity here. What's really interesting about this passage and the passage we're referring to is where Joseph goes, looks for his brothers because he's told by his father to go and find them. And he finds them. Actually, he doesn't find them initially. He actually meets some sort of man on the way to Shechem. And he's like, oh, yeah, they were here, but now they're in Dothan, I think it is. And mm-hmm. he goes all the way to Dothan and finds his brothers. And when he gets there, his brother's like, oh, here is this... Uh, Dreamer. Yeah, and you know, it's actually... Um, it's more like dream master. Oh. Right? It's even more lofty and if pretentious. I had, if I had the ability to recreate my gaming IDs, that might be the new one. Yeah, dream yeah. master. I, I read this earlier in, in a commentary where it was like, Baal... Ha ha lo mot. Uh, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but it's the Baal in front of it is the the word for master or husband. Um, and he is the master of dreams, mm. right? So it's like, oh, look at this dream master, right? And that tension that's amongst them is very real. And they 
con- they conspire to get rid of him. Now, what's something that's worth noting is that it's the inevitability of where Joseph is headed to that the text to some degree is communicating. Here's what okay. I mean. This guy actually wears the coat that exemplified his father's favoritism. Like he has no context. Like he's I'm hearing victim I'm hearing victim blaming here. Right? Like you know, some some violence happens, God forbids, to someone, and one of the questions that has been asked kind of stereotypically, and uh-huh. I think we're evolving from this is what were you wearing? Oh, well, sure. I mean, that's an anachronism, right? Uh, and I, I get the sentiment of how you can extract that, but that he puts on the very garment that is going to trigger their animosity even more, hmm. right? Hmm. Because the garment that he's wearing is a representation of the father's favoritism, which they actually hate, as well as his embodiment is this representation of the superiority hmm. of his life and existence over and against theirs, which they, they they're resent. They're on the field working and he's not. Right. And so not only that, but then he goes to Shechem and he meets this person who stewards him to where his brothers are. Now, all of this is just seemingly events that are transpiring. They're just, you know, oh, he's looking for his brothers. He met this guy, gave him directions. But we know that by the end of the story, right, the famous line that what you intended for evil, God meant for good, God meant for good. Mm. And so that as this guy is actually not knowingly walking into this faded sort of path of his, because we already know In Genesis 37, the dreams have already set a course for this young man's life, Mm. right? And so as this is transpiring, it's headed somewhere. And where is it heading? It's heading to the sheaves bowing down. It's headed to the sun, moon, and stars. We don't quite know what's going on yet, but it's almost as though there is a fate over his life that he is inconsequentially or unexpectedly actually moving towards bit by bit. Yeah. And and it's absolutely clear that God has a plan for his life. I think that type of language is a amen ready kind of language. Mm -hmm. God's got a plan for your life. But then it brings up a whole bunch of like kind of follow-up questions like, well, then is everything that God plans inevitable? Like how much does free will choice play a role into this? Maybe if uh, Joseph wasn't as arrogant or kind of, you know, just proud about the way that he was handling these revelations that God had given him could it maybe could he maybe so gone to the end result with have it without having to go to prison and being sold into slavery and all the things like all of this is hypotheticals and maybes right but we have to remember what the text is about mm-hmm. the text isn't about revealing the Joseph and his plan and his yeah, life yeah Joseph and the benefit of his life and the text is also not about uh, defending the classical attributes and the philosophical questions around the existence of the divine hmm. like The text is about a God who is present in the life of these people because this God has made a commitment to bring an end to the sin and death that humanity is enslaved to. Hmm. Let it not be forgotten that the reason why Joseph receives a revelation of his cosmic rulership Hmm. is because he is embodying somebody that is going to come who will deliver humanity from the cosmic powers of sin and death, right? So so when I take inventory of my life and I sing that song, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good, like, yes, there's certainly layers upon which it affects my personal life mm-hmm. and God is absolutely interested in that. But mm-hmm. there's maybe the if, if I'm so tunnel vision on that, I might be missing the bigger picture as to what God is doing through my life, sure, mm-hmm. but at work in the world or in the community around me. Yeah, so this is where we've had this conversation for other uh, content creation that we're making, right? This this video of Matt Chandler. Yeah. Right? Where yeah, Matt yeah. Chandler... This is a shout out, by the way, for the for the internet church thing. We, we've talked about that. I mean, I guess, yeah, we yeah, talked about because I'm have. here in Hawaii. We, we mentioned but that yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something we've been working on internet church. And we've drawn back to this Matt Chandler video where Matt Chandler's teaching about, hey, we read scripture wrong where we read scripture about ourselves and we read ourselves into the story. And then we think it's saying something about ourselves. And then he goes, yeah. I love you enough to help you out on this. Let me tell you something. You're not David. Yeah. This famous line where he's just like, you're not Joseph. You're not Abraham. Right. You're not like, stop. 
Yeah, right? yeah. See, I'm doing it already. You're doing it already, yeah. right? Like, that's all right. We all need that reminder. Like there's certain lessons that we can draw out, but only as a consequence of actually dealing with the story for what it is. Mm, and the okay. story is God is working this stuff out for good because he's intending to save humanity through the family lineage of Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Joseph, although it seems as though he's fated to death because if you're actually reading the text in Genesis 37, all these themes of Cain and Abel and brothers against each other are emerging. So the mm -hmm. expectation for Joseph's story right now is that Joseph is going to die. Why? Because he has this beef with his brothers. He's bringing a bad report. There's shepherds. They go out into a field. There's antagonism between them because one's a favorite. All of that are echoes of Cain and Abel. Yeah. So that if you're reading the text intentionally, the way that this beautiful work of art is actually trying to communicate like, hey, you see all these themes and these. Mm. this is indicating something. Joseph, unbeknownst to him, wearing this silly coat of his, is actually going to end up in the pit of Sheol, wow. because that's what happened to Abel, who was favored, had antagonism with his brother because his brother didn't like the fact that he was favored, yeah. right? So if you're reading at this way, you expect Joseph to end up in a pit mm. because that's where his life is actually faded. It, it's kind of like if someone were to, to show you a, a YouTube video without any context and it's a, it's a mother, father, and a kid at uh, some kind of play it's maybe in a urban city environment it's late at night they mm -hmm. leave maybe a bat flies by mm -hmm. and a gunman mm -hmm. shows up all of a sudden i know that oh. these parents are dying yeah because absolutely absolutely There's, yeah yeah but why because that's exactly it justin because these stories are myths not that they're not true but myths in the sense that they're supposed to organize and frame the way you actually look at the world mm -hmm. they organize culture they organize consciousness right? The way you're actually supposed to think about life is through these great grand stories. Now, these stories, you know, we hold them to be true, but just because like, for instance, uh, George Washington, like he really did uh, cross the Delaware River, right? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's also myth making, right? Mm -hmm. The first shots of the revolution were fired at Lexington and Concord, mm -hmm. right? But that's also myth making. Why? Because the consciousness that we have about America actually flows through these stories, right? The Boston Massacre, I think April 5, 17, uh, something. Uh, so yeah, 1775, 1770, something like that. The Boston Massacre, that really did happen. But that's a myth making, hmm. right? Because then you have the presence of John Adams. Anyway, all of these things, right? Like they make what we understand about the nation, right? In that same way, these stories are the myth-making pieces by which we're supposed to understand God's actions in the world through. And unbeknownst to us, we have this little human who is wearing this coat, innocently thinking about, oh, I had this dream where I was uh, over the sun, moon, and stars. And 17, not reading the room, and we're all reading with horror yeah. because we're like, dude, you don't know where your life is going. Yeah. And then his brothers meet him like, yeah, put up, throw him in the pit. And you're like, yep, that's expected. <laughs> yep, that's where this was going. Do you think, okay, so the, the pit is expected. We, we see that coming a mile away if we're paying attention to the text. There's a little twist at the end where it talks about now he's like heading towards Egypt. Egypt has has showed up a couple times in the narrative. Is there some kind of nod here with the fact that now he's taken out of the pit? He's on his way to Egypt. There's kind of a, a nodding that something else is about to happen. Well, Egypt is the place where the people of God are not correctly honored or seen, misunderstood. Or I mean, think about Abraham when he goes down to Egypt. And he, he was always on guard. Always on guard because they have no, you, what did he assume? They have no fear of God in this place, right? right? You remember this, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. We talked about this earlier. So, and we know as we look forward that Egypt is going to be the place of enslavement, right? Mm. And we know in the great, the great scheme of scripture, Egypt is this place where Pharaoh, who is serpent-like, embodies the... Um, the conniving and the oppressive nature of the serpent all the way back in Genesis chapter uh, three, right? So Egypt is not a good place for the people of God. So that mm. Joseph is headed, to, he's headed down to mm. Egypt. That's very intentional, right? Although he missed dying, he's still headed down into the so realm of death. So he gets from, goes from bad to worse. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. And so, and then you have this uh, contrasted with the way that Jacob actually responds when his children show him the coat of many colors uh, that's dipped in the blood where he's like, I 
right? Like he won't come to me. I'm going to go to him and Sheol. Like I can't go with him now, but I will, right? This mm-hmm. is at the end of, of uh, 35. 35, right? And all his sons and his daughters rose to console him. That's Jacob. And he refused to be consoled. And he said, rather, I will go down to my soul, to, to my son in Sheol mourning. Interesting. Right? So this expectation that death looms, right? Like, so when the story begins with Joseph walking the hills, trying to go to Shechem, you, I, I think, I'm pretty sure that the narrative is supposed to be like, yeah, da, 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 in the da, hills da, are alive, right? the sound of music. Right. But over the hills, there should be some dark clouds the dark shadow because there is foreboding, right? Yeah. And now his, his brothers are like this crouching figure that they're, they're, they're animals that are waiting to actually empower him. Like all of this are callbacks to, to the beginning of the story. So this is what I mean by faded. This mm-hmm. is what I mean. Like this narrative is revealing something. And ultimately what the narrative is trying to do here is construct this, these patterns that emerge for us so that something about the faithfulness of God emerges. Mm. This isn't about me and how I could derive some principle about how, you know, when I'm Joseph in my life and, you know, I'm, I'm in the pits of despair, mm-hmm. God raises me up, right? Like, cool, cool story, bro. But Joseph is a type of Christ. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, yeah. This is telling us something about Jesus so that what the enemy meant for evil when he killed Jesus, like God turned around for good because God in the person of Jesus overcame death Mm. because he went to the pit for us and now we can cross over into life because jesus in the same way that joseph ends up saving his brothers jesus has saved us his brothers Mm. so that when we talk about what the enemy meant for evil god turned for good it's first about jesus and since our lives are hitting christ with god the good is absolutely true and alive in us, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So then the way we actually live in this world is from victory. Mm-hmm. I'm not living in this world like, oh, well, you know what? I'm Joseph and I hit the pits of despair. Like, <laughs> yo, when we're in the pits of despair, it's still good because we're on the other side of what Jesus has done so that we can endure all things through Christ who strengthens us. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. it's first about Jesus, then us. Mm-hmm. In prepping internet church uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've kind of landed on one passage because we've we've literally been talking Genesis 37 and yeah, for, for internet church and kind of one of the areas that we're finding our climax. And I'm wondering if in the last couple of minutes here, it's worth noting this 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 passage in Hebrews where it talks about Jesus not being ashamed to call us brothers. That's right. Hebrews 2, right? And Hebrews 2, what is it, like verse 11-ish? I think it is. Let me look it up real quick. I, I think it's Hebrews 2 verse 11 or verse... And that's exactly, he's going to come back and tell of God's name to his brothers because he's not ashamed to call his brothers because he actually has the understanding of where his life was like, this was so dope. Joseph doesn't understand where he's going. The Mm. steps that he's taking, he doesn't understand. All he knows is he has this revelation of like, oh, the stocks, the sheaves (laughs) or the uh, sun, moon and stars. Oh, he doesn't know that to get there, he's going to have to go through death, Mm. right? Mm. He's going to have to go through slavery. On the other, contrast that with Jesus. He knew. He knew. Yeah. And he set his face toward Jerusalem. So instead of going down to Egypt, Jesus actually goes up to Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem has now become like Egypt. It's the place of death Mm -hmm. because the brothers that ought to protect Jesus have become antagonistic towards him that they're willing to kill him to secure their standing. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. This is why Matthew, when he starts, he's like, yo, like, like Hosea said, out of Egypt, I called my son. It's a great reversal. Oh, wow. That Egypt is not really the Egypt that Jesus went to when he was a kid to actually escape Pharaoh. Egypt is actually Jerusalem now because this is the godless place. Hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a whole nother topic. And maybe we'll get to it one day how the book of Matthew is structured after the whole Old Testament. Like oh. Matthew is the Old Testament re-embodied in Jesus. Right? Ooh. But let me not do that right now. <laughs> okay. So we're at Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 11. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Yeah. Saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. Right. And this is why. This is why. If you go back to, um, if you go back to, what is it? Verse. 
Yeah, verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Hmm. So Jesus suffered on our behalf, and he tasted death for all of us. That's verse 14. Right, That through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So then we were the ones that were enslaved and he stepped into that slavery. We were the ones in the pit. He came down and entered the pit to bring us out. Hmm. Right, This is why he's the antitypical Joseph. Right, So that this is about him. And the reason he did this, the reason he went into death is because he saw us as brothers. And so, yeah, when we read the text, man, um, we see instruction and insights, and then we want to apply it to our life. Like, cool story, bro. But uh, it's first and foremost about Jesus. Hmm. And these stories are, again, myths that are true, but that they're supposed to organize the way we think about the world because we first think through the revelation of Jesus. There you go. Well, hey, uh, we've been talking about Internet Church quite a bit before we hop off. Uh, talk to people about how they can connect with it. You and I actually haven't gamed this through. How, how's it, what's the distribution going to look like? But I'm guessing it has something to do with texting our phone number. Yeah. So if you text uh, 808-204-4372 and just text Internet Church, uh, we'll get you hooked up. We're doing we're just planting a digital church. Yeah. Native online. No brick and mortar just people uh connecting around the goodness of god in our lives through jesus and we're gonna do it every single weekend i think we settled on uh friday night east coast so maybe like eight or nine east coast time you, you say every weekend but i know that we're scaling oh, up to oh, that. oh yeah that's i'm messing up i'm messing up we're doing it every other weekend every first, other week. yeah right yeah. and um yeah by the time this goes out you should be able to just text um, internet, internet Church to 808-204-4372 and you'll get the details. Cool. We'll see you guys there.